Hi, I'm Will Lesh, and this is Celestial Navigation, and we're here to introduce the subject and explain how it all works and give you a working knowledge of what's happening when you work out a site and how to use the sextant. Uh, the key to Celestial Navigation is it's much simpler than a lot of people think. Um, and I have taught it many, many times uh, from teaching one other skipper, one other sailor on a beach in the Bahamas just before he headed offshore for Canada, having never used Celestial Navigation, and he actually got to Canada successfully, to teaching in formal classroom settings in Boston and Seattle with large classes. And so I have taught it a number of ways, and over the years I've found ways to teach it that explain it in a way that really anybody can understand it and master the subject. It's often taught, I actually have had an experience where I taught it, it took the class of celestial navigation in a very formal setting and found it quite a complex uh, subject to understand uh, the way it was taught. The reality is it's really very simple and the concepts are very simple. So if we explain the concepts and you understand how it works, then filling in the details is quite easy. If you don't understand it to start with, then you can just be snowballed with all the deep details and it starts to just get super confusing because your basic understanding isn't firm enough. But when we clarify how it works first and you grasp that, then filling in the details is easy. Now, um, we're going to use three diagrams to explain the entire system, how celestial navigation works. It's really just three simple diagrams. As we progress, though, this morning, you'll want to make sure that you copy each of the diagrams. So the most important tool for you this morning is paper and pencil. If you don't do the diagrams yourself, it's going to be really, really hard to remember them by the end. But if you draw the diagrams on your own piece of paper, as we draw them here on the whiteboard, that will give you a really good working understanding of how it all works. Now my thinking is that if you don't understand how it works, it's really hard to do it. Even if you have cheat sheets with 40 steps, do this, 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 you're going to make mistakes if you don't understand what each step is about. So the understanding comes first, and then the details, and then you should be able to work out a problem, a celestial site, just on a blank sheet of paper. If you understand it, you don't need little tips or cheating, you know, steps, follow steps. If you don't understand it, no matter how many steps you're following, you're going to make mistakes. And if you end up in the right hemisphere, north versus south, you'll be lucky. Um, but if you understand it, the whole thing is quite simple. I think one of the reasons it got complicated and seems hard to learn is because we use a lot of terms that aren't familiar. We can say a whole sentence as a navigator where you might not understand a single one of the important words it's just like a foreign language. Not only do we use different terms, but we use abbreviations for those terms. And we use, sometimes it's an abbreviation, sometimes it's an acronym. So we can talk in sort of this different celestial naviga, navigese language and make the whole subject seem incredibly complicated. And I think maybe that was done by the British Navy when they were press ganging their crews and they didn't want the crew to know how easy it was to navigate. It's pretty hard to mutiny if you're out in the middle of the ocean and you have no idea where you are or how to get anywhere else because you can't navigate. So maybe this was done intentionally. But we'll sweep all that away. I'll call things by names you'll understand and we'll make it pretty simple and obvious. Oh, well, I should mention um, this whole 
series is brought to you by Tippy Canoe Boats. That's my company. And you can find us on the web at modelsailboat.com. So please visit our website and enjoy. Uh, lots of fun stuff on there. Okay, let's uh, start. Well, first, let's figure out where you are at. How are you with differential calculus? Um, oh, you look a little worried there. Oh, well, not to worry. We don't need any differential calculus for celestial navigation. Uh, not involved at all. It's not relevant. But uh, how about uh, geometry and trigonometry? Um, are we better? With... Oh, a little stronger with that, but look a little uncertain. So, well, not to worry. We don't need geometry or trigonometry for celestial navigation. But now let's get to the crux of it. How are you with adding and subtracting? Oh, I see some brightening there. Yes, good. You do need adding and subtracting to do celestial navigation. Um, that's all the math you need, adding and subtracting. It's remarkably simple stuff. All the difficult math is done for you by the tables. And uh, you just look in the book and it tells you the answer. You don't have to do the, the, any difficult math at all. Okay, so a simple subject, three diagrams, and you'll understand exactly how celestial navigation works, the whole subject. And then later on in another segment, we can do the details. There are a fair number of details, but they all make sense. They're all pretty, all totally logical. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to start with the first diagram. And as we do diagrams, I'll show you what we're diagramming on the globe and how we're looking at the globe. We're going to be slicing the globe in different ways. Sometimes we may want to slice it right through North Pole, South Pole, uh, center of the Earth, just for that slice. Sometimes we'll slice it at an angle. Sometimes we'll try to show the whole globe as a round surface. So different ways, and I'll show you on the globe how we're, how we're doing our diagram. Uh, the first diagram has several parts to it, though. And I told you three diagrams. We're going to look at several aspects of the first diagram separately first. These don't count as your three diagrams. They're just sort of extra. <laughs> Um, the first thing I want to make sure everyone is clear about latitude and longitude. You have to understand latitude and longitude in order to um, be able to do celestial. Okay, let's do a diagram here. The first diagram, we're going to look at the globe as though we're poised up in space in satellite right over the North Pole, looking down on the globe. And that diagram will look like this. Because we want to take a look at longitude and how longitude works. There's the Earth. Here's the North Pole right here. North Pole. This would be similar to the equator looking down on the Earth like that from the top. And longitude. Here's England down here. And Europe, of course. Something over here. Uh, America. Or Canada. And North Pole. Longitude, zero degrees of longitude, goes right through Greenwich, England. That's zero degrees of longitude. And then longitude is quite simple. Uh, this will be 10 degrees of longitude. Or let's do it 15 degrees. Let's call that 15 degrees because typically we talk about longitude in 15 degree increments because as the Earth spins, the Sun moves 15 degrees per hour. Uh, apparently, approximately. So 15, 30 degrees, 45, 65, 45, 60. Um, so each degree of longitude indicates an angle. Now the thing about longitude that you have to be careful with is one degree of longitude. If you're standing with your feet on the North Pole, uh, You'd be really cold, first of all, but you can walk 60 degrees of longitude in like a fraction of a second. It's only a few inches. So right at the North Pole, 60 degrees of longitude is nothing. It's a few inches at the most. Whereas at the equator, to go 60 degrees of longitude 
is many, many miles. In fact, at the, right at the equator, 60 degrees of longitude, each degree of longitude at the equator is about 60 nautical miles. So 60 degrees of longitude at the equator is 60 times 60, 3,600 nautical miles. So longitude cannot be used to measure distance except right at the equator um, because it varies. Uh, one degree of longitude doesn't equate to a certain distance unless you're right on the equator. Okay, so that's longitude. And longitude goes all the way around uh, to 180 degrees here. West longitude, 180. And east longitude, 180 degrees. 180 east, 180 west. Okay, that's longitude. Any questions? No. Good. Now, let's look at latitude. And make sure we're clear with that. Hopefully this is review or just so obvious you already know it. You can fast forward if you want. But pause here for a minute because latitude, some people miss, have a misconception of latitude that makes celestial navigation impossible. Um, so latitude, the misconception that some people have is that the earth is sliced like a tomato through first through the equator and then 10, 15 degrees of latitude, 30 degrees of latitude, like so. Um, so, latitude, and we abbreviate latitude L-A-T, of course. So, this is what some people think of as latitude. Here's the top of the earth, and you're slicing it like a tomato into sections. Here's different degrees, 15 degrees sections of latitude sliced like that. Here's the equator. No! That is not latitude. Latitude is not like slicing a tomato. If you think of latitude this way, you can't understand anything at all. So, erase that diagram from your mind instantly, and probably even better not to put it on your paper. Okay, so scribble it out of your paper. Let's look at latitude, what latitude really is. Here's the Earth. Yeah. Keep the blue, that shows up better. With sort of a flat spot there. Well, um, so here's the Earth. Now we're looking at the Earth, the globe from the side. Let's put in the North Pole here. Let's get a better globe, actually. And then we'll put in the North Pole. Oops, this side wants to be flat, I don't know why. We've got a problem. There. A bit better. Now, we'll put in the North Pole and the South Pole and the Equator. North Pole here. South Pole there. Equator right across the middle. And here's the center of the Earth. Okay, now the way latitude works is latitude measures an angle at the center of the earth from the line right through the equator, slicing right through the equator, measuring up at an angle, and then we'll call this 15 degrees of latitude. We can measure the latitude here at the center of the earth. We can measure it here at the surface of the earth. It doesn't matter, 15 degrees here. And so, latitude is not slicing, it's measuring an angle up from the equator. And south latitudes, let's see here, it's 45 degrees south latitude. 45 degrees south, measuring an angle at the center of the earth, down to the equator, or measuring it on the surface of the earth, 45 degrees. It's the same angle. We can talk about it either way, it doesn't matter. 45 degrees south. Now, latitude, we can talk about it in another way. 15 degrees of latitude is exactly 15 times 60. So what is that? Uh, 60, 600, 900, 900 nautical miles. Okay, 900 
nautical miles. Now, if you ever wondered why we have nautical miles and why we don't use land miles out sailing, it's because of celestial navigation. Nautical miles, land miles would be really, really complicated to use in celestial navigation because there's no direct equivalent in degrees. But nautical miles translate very easily. Six, one, degree of nauti one degree of latitude equals 60 nautical miles. Simple, con simple conversion. And that means since one, one degree of latitude has 60 minutes of latitude in it, one minute equals one nautical mile. That makes navigation really easy. And that's why we use nautical miles. So 15 degrees of latitude, 15 times 60 equals 900 nautical miles. So we can talk about this distance in three ways. We can talk about it as an angle at the center of the earth, we can talk about it as an angle on the surface of the earth, or we can talk about it as nautical miles. It doesn't make any difference. It's all the same, basically. Okay, now people may understand that fairly well, but now we have to do take it one step farther, because this is important. Now, um, let's... This time we slice the Earth right through the North Pole, the South Pole, the center of the Earth. Just sliced right through. Now we're going to slice the Earth differently and show you that same concept, how it works. We're going to slice the Earth at some completely different angle. Right through, let's go right through um, North America. Let's go right through North America and Hawaii. North America, we're here in Puget Sound area, northwest Washington, and Hawaii's down here. Where is Hawaii? Should be there. There. Pretty small. Okay, we're going to slice the earth right through northwest Washington, Hawaii, and through the center of the earth. We can slice the earth through three points. If we add a fourth point, that won't be on our flat plane, our plate that we've created. We can, but with three points, the center of the earth, we always have the center of the earth on any slice we're taking. Northwest Washington and Hawaii, we can get those three points right on a single plane. So um, now we have the center of the earth, Northwest Washington and Hawaii, all on this slice. Okay, it's not. There's no North Pole. The North Pole is North Pole is up off the board, and South Pole is down below the board. Not on this flat plane. Now we can do this. We can draw a line out through Northwest Washington, and line out through Hawaii, and we can measure the angle here between the two at the center of the earth, the angle from the center of the earth through northwest Washington and through Hawaii and that looks like it's about 24 degrees let's say and so we can say at the surface that that's 24 degrees and that translates into how many nautical miles? 24 times 60 is going to be 1,200 plus uh, 240, so 1,440 nautical miles. Okay. Um, Any questions about this? We can talk about distance on the surface of the Earth as an angle. We can talk about distance as an angle at the center of the Earth. We can talk about it as nautical miles. It's all the same. And we can do that with any slice through the Earth's surface that includes the center of the Earth. Okay? This is why not, not, celestial navigation is pretty simple. Because of this, the way we, we talk about distance. Often we talk about distance as a number of degrees, degrees and minutes.
We tend to say degrees, minutes, and tenths of minutes. Uh, we don't use seconds very much. It's just to, we're not concerned about that level of accuracy. 24 degrees, 10 minutes. Okay, or 10.5 minutes. Okay, degrees, minutes, and tenths of minutes. We don't uh, go to seconds. Okay, that's distance and latitude. Now, let's take a couple more concepts and then we'll get to our first diagram and put all this together into our first diagram. Okay, let's, um, let's look at light. Here's the Earth here. Actually, let's make that even smaller. A little bit smaller there. Here's the Earth here. Let's put a satellite up in the sky here. Now, that light from the satellite, some of it's coming straight down. Actually, if you're standing right here, let's put Joe here, standing right here. Here's Joe. He looks straight up and sees the satellite straight over his head. And that satellite light, actually let's put Joe standing, he's lying down there, let's put him standing up, right there, on the surface of the earth. Okay, there's Joe, right over his head, he looks straight up, right over his head is the satellite light. That satellite light is coming down through the top of his head, down through his body, through his feet, and continuing, if it could continue, like a gamma ray or something, that light would continue right to the center of the earth like that. Now, if somebody else is standing over here, up in Bellingham, Puget Sound area, you're here, that light's coming at a funny angle to you. It's not coming straight down on your head. It's not, not coming parallel to this beam of light. It's coming at a funny angle. Okay, now, if we move farther out, let's get the, uh, the uh, a satellite that's much higher, or some body that's much farther away, now the lines of light are not at such a big angle here to each other. They're getting closer to parallel. Now, let's move this farther out. Let's move this. Well, the first star is 4.24 light years away. 4.24 light years away. That would be moving this point out almost as far as where the moon is. I mean, it's, it's way farther than the east. I mean, it's in my diagram here, we'd have to move this point for the earth being this size, we'd have to move this point as far as the east coast or farther, way out. Now we've got light coming in. We don't have light coming in at weird angles here. We have light coming in from so far away that the light that I see is coming virtually in a line parallel to the light that Joe sees. All the light from that distant, distant body, celestial body, are parallel to each other, wherever we are on the surface of the Earth. All those lines of light are parallel. Now that's a bit of a, an approximation, but they're so close to parallel that we can assume that they are parallel. Okay? So that's how the light from the sun, the planets, the stars is coming down to the earth. Parallel lines. If you think of the light as coming from a point that's close to the earth at funny angles, all these different angles, celestial navigation absolutely does not work or you'd have to correct for the angles and that is something we don't want to have to do. The only time we correct for this angle, we call this parallax, the only time we correct for it is with the moon. The moon's not quite far enough away to assume it's infinitely far away and the beams of light are parallel. With the moon we make a simple correction and say, well it's a little bit too close to make this assumption so we're going to just nudge the, nudge the numbers. The table does it for us. We'll just nudge the numbers a little bit to make a simple correction for that. But overall, celestial, even with the moon, we make this assumption first that the lines of light are parallel, 
And then we make a slight correction to, because that assumption, the moon's a little bit too close for that assumption to work perfectly. Okay, parallel line, lines of light. Now, let's actually leave these lines up here. Some of them, two of them, that's all we need. Let's leave those two lines up here, we'll get rid of this. Now, we're back to seventh grade. Seventh grade. And, yes, you do need a little bit of geometry. This is the only geometry you need. Right here. Probably the simplest part of geometry. First thing you probably were told in seventh grade in geometry. If you have two parallel lines and you have a single line crossing those two, what can we say about the angles? Let's say this angle here is X. Or 30 degrees. Looks like about 30 degrees. Okay, so that angle there is 30 degrees. Big question. What is this angle here? Is this a, these two, one, one line crossing another line, this angle is X, then this angle, yes, you're right, X. This is also 30 degrees. Okay, now the big question, the really big question. These two lines are parallel. This is a single line crossing those two. What is this angle here? What is that angle? Okay, you got it. X, 30 degrees. And now the final question, and this is all we need for the first diagram to understand the first diagram, which we're getting to in a second here. This angle here is the same as that angle, which is the same as that angle, which is the same as that angle. So this is x equals 30 degrees. Now, maybe you've already jumped ahead and put all these three, these little diagrams together into a single diagram. And what I'm about to show you, which is the first diagram of the three diagrams you need to understand celestial navigation. Maybe you've already combined it all in your head and it's like, Oh, I see it, but maybe not. It's no more complicated than what we've just seen, putting these three, these several different concepts together. Okay, and this is really what celestial navigation is about. And I get excited about it because it's such a neat thing. It's fairly simple, but it's giving you a position on the face of the Earth within half a mile based on celestial planets that are so far away, we can say they're infinitely far away. Many, many light years away, some of the stars that we use for celestial navigation. Or the planets not quite as far away, or the sun eight, eight light minutes away. Uh, pretty far. So, it's a neat subject. It's really fun. It's really cool. You can understand it. You can grasp it all and be an expert, really, in this one session, you'll understand it. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're doing. Here's the Earth. Again, there's the Earth. Now let's let's make that a little. Let's move. Give ourselves a little bit more room. Okay, and this is where you want to be putting this diagram on your paper as I draw it. Um, because that's the only way you'll really understand it. it. Just looking at it is different from drawing it. Okay, we're gonna move this diagram over just a little bit here. So we have a little bit more room on this side. Okay, now, this time we're slicing the Earth again. Let's slice it, let's be consistent. Let's slice the Earth through Bellingham and through Hawaii. We're gonna slice it at that same angle and through the center of the Earth. Okay, so we'll get the center of the Earth on there, right there. This is me having just um, sailed off the coast of uh, Bellingham, Seattle, sailing out uh, through the Straits of um, Juan de Fuca, out to sea. And I'm trying to get to Hawaii. Hawaii is farther down here. So we slice the Earth at a funny angle. 
we haven't got the equator on here, we haven't got the North or South Pole. We've sliced it through Bellingham, through Hawaii, and through the center of the Earth. Okay, and so we've made a flat plate, a flat drawing. Here I am, just offshore, uh, off the coast of Northwest Washington. Here's Hawaii, and here's the center of the Earth. Three points. We can always get three points on a flat plane. Okay. <clears throat> Joe happens to be in Hawaii already. Here's Joe standing in Hawaii. Okay. He's waiting for me there. Actually, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should have that be a female. <laughs> anyway, more incentive. Uh, anyway, we'll, anyway, we'll call it Joe. And Joe... is here. Let's draw a line out through Joe. That's not a very good line. Here's a line out through Joe. Now it so happens that Joe looks straight up and sees a bright star above his head. Right above his head. Straight up over his head. That starlight is coming down through Joe's head to his feet and would continue down through the center of the earth, to the center of the earth, like that. Now, if I'm up here in Bellingham, that star is not going to be overhead for me. It, if overhead would be up here. It's going to, that starlight is coming in in parallel lines. So it would be coming in at this angle here. So this line of light from the same star that Joe's seeing dragged overhead would be parallel to this line of light. Okay? Parallel lines. Now, let's just add one more line coming from the center of the Earth right out through where my position is. Here's my position. Okay. That's the start of your diagram. Try to get that on the paper. Center of the Earth. Joe here with the star right over his head, the two parallel lines of light coming in. Make sure this line of light and this line of light are parallel. And then this line is just a, a line from, this, from my position down to the center of the Earth. Now, when we, shoot, uh, the, when we shoot a star, when we use the sextant and shoot the star, we're shooting the height of the star above the horizon. So we take it and we get the angle that we look out at the horizon and then we look at the star and we see how high the star is above the horizon. Let's um, say it's pretty high. Let's say it's at like 40, 40, 50 degrees. The star is up about 50 degrees above the horizon. <clears throat> what is our horizon? Here's the starlight. What's our horizon in this diagram? Well, think of the... Horizon is a pretty clear word. Horizon, horizontal. Everything that's horizontal is, that's what the horizon is, horizontal. Vertical is straight down to the center of the earth. For my position, this line represents vertical. So that's a vertical straight down to the center of the earth, straight down through my feet to the center of the earth. That's vertical. Horizon is horizontal. Vertical and horizontal are always perpendicular to each other. So if I want to add the horizon to this diagram, I just need to do a line that's... See if I can do a straight line here. A line that is ver perpendicular to the vertical. And that line just barely touches the surface of the Earth right where my feet are. And that is actually my horizon. It's actually my horizon if my eye level is down right at water level. There's a minor correction when I'm up on in the cockpit of my boat and my eye might be eight feet above water level. There's a minor correction because then I'm looking down on what the real horizon is. I'm looking down and the horizon is a little farther out. But basically for now, we can think of the horizon as being a line that just barely kisses the surface of the earth right here at my feet and is perpendicular to the vertical line down through the center of the earth. Remember, this is me, this is us, you're on the boat too. 
I'm going to say us. That's us, not U.S. Us, right there. Okay. Now let's try to clean this up a little bit. That'll give you time to get your diagram caught up. Because I want this to be really clean and, and neat. So here's the surface of the Earth. Here's our horizon, the line tangent to the surface of the Earth. And here's the perpendicular between the vertical, which is straight down to the center of the Earth, and the horizontal, which is the horizon. Okay, now, what we're trying to figure out here is our distance from this point. This point, Joe happens to be here. Let's say this isn't even Hawaii. Let's say this is just a point on the surface of the Earth directly underneath that star. Joe could be in a boat or he could be on land, it doesn't matter, but Joe is looking straight up at that star. That's where the star is. It could happen to be over Hawaii, it could be happen to be over some other body of land or over the ocean, it doesn't matter. Joe is looking straight up at that star. This is the point directly under the star. It doesn't matter if Joe's there or not. Let's take Joe out of there. This is the point directly underneath the star here. If Joe were there, the star is right over his head. That's called the ground point of the star. That makes sense. Ground point. <laughs> here. <laughs> now I'm throwing definitions at you and terminology. But that one makes sense. The ground point of the star. GP. And how do we know where that is? Well, we just look in the tables. We look in the nautical almanac. The nautical almanac is amazing. It tells us the latitude and longitude of every star for every second of the year. This is year definite. This, this happens to be 1992 almanac. Every year you need a new almanac. It tells you where the sun is in latitude and longitude, where the moon is, where the planets, each planet is, and where the 30 navigational stars are for every second of that year that this book is created for. You can find all that online too. You can find exactly the pages of the Nautical Almanac online and check it out. <clears throat> so we can work out exactly, we can look in the table and find out exactly where, let's call this, this well, let's, in this case, let's just say this was the sun. S-U-N, sun. This is the latitude and longitude of the sun at a certain second of a certain day when we took our sextant sight. We were at this location, we took a sextant sight on the sun, this is where the sun was, we looked it up, latitude and longitude in the table, in the nautical almanac. We don't call it latitude and longitude, but it's, a, it's basically just latitude and longitude. So the position of the sun, we know where that point is, that's a definite point. We're someplace up here, we don't know exactly where that is, but we took a sextant sight measuring the height of the sun above the horizon. That would be this angle here. The height of the sun above the horizon. From the horizon up to the light coming from the sun, this angle here. That um, angle looks like about 50 degrees here. That angle, <laughs> we don't call it SEX. Um, remember this was a Victorian art science. Uh, off the sextant, we call it HS, height sextant, height sextant. That's what we measured off the sextant when we looked out at the horizon, we looked up at the sun, and measured the angle between the horizon and the sun, 50 degrees. Okay, now, what we're trying to figure out here is we know this point from the table, from the Nautical Almanac, and we're trying to figure out how far away from this point we are. We don't know where we are. We just know we're someplace off the coast of Northwest Washington. We want to find out this distance between these two points, a known point and the distance to where we are. 
How can we do it from this diagram? Well, we're moments away from understanding this. If you understand what we've got so far. Horizon, light from the sun coming in. This is the point directly under the sun, the latitude and longitude of the sun. The sun's light going straight through that point on the surface of the earth, down to the center of the earth. This is just <clears throat> a vertical from where we are, straight down to the center of the earth. And this is the horizon, horizontal. And this is the angle up to the sun. All the sun's lights coming in parallel, parallel lines of light because the sun is virtually infinitely far away. Okay, now let's apply our geometry. The geometry we just saw. Okay, how does that fit in? Whoa, look at this. Okay, this is 90 degrees here, perpendicular. So this angle here, whoa, what's that angle? If the whole angle is 90, this has to be 90 minus 50. The entire angle minus this part, 90 minus 50. Or, let's think of it as 90 minus HS. Okay. This is HS, height sextant. This is 90 minus HS, height sextant. 90 minus the sextant reading. And now, big question, where are we here? What is this angle here? And look, we've got, we can continue this line so it's more like our former diagram, previous diagram. We've got two parallel lines crossed by a single, we, whoa, too excited here. Cross, we can continue this line hypothetically. Two parallel lines crossed by a single line. Let's continue that line. Just, we don't need the continuation, but it makes it even more similar to our previous diagram. Two parallel lines crossed by a single line. This is 90 minus HS here. So this has to be 90 minus HS. 90, deg whoopsie. 90 degrees minus our sextant reading. And if that angle there is 90 minus HS, the distance on the surface of the Earth is also 90 minus HS. And that distance from us to the point directly under the Sun, the ground point of the Sun, is 90 minus our sextant reading. If our sextant reading was 50 degrees, 90 minus 50, 90 minus HS, is 40 degrees. 90 minus HS at the center of the Earth, same angle as this angle here, is 40 degrees. 90 minus HS here is 40 degrees. And the distance from us down to this point directly under the Sun, the GP of the Sun, latitude and longitude, that distance is 40 degrees. And 40 degrees, if you want nautical miles, 40 times 60 is 2400 nautical miles. So now, from our sextant reading, we know the distance from us to a known point, the point directly under the sun. And if Joe's there, we can call him up on our satellite phone and say, Hey Joe, we're 2400 nautical miles away from you. We'll be there pretty soon. Okay? The sextant reading gives us the distance from the point directly underneath the sun. Joe, at this point, looks straight up and says, well, right now the sun's directly over my head. We say, well, we just got a sextant reading of 50 degrees on the sun. That means we are 40 degrees away from you, or 2,400 nautical miles away from you. Okay, how does that help to have, to know the distance away from a fixed point on the surface of the earth? Does that tell us where we are? It gives us a piece of information, important information, about where we are. Does it tell us where we are? Well, let's look at the next diagram. We're going to do one more diagram 
and then we'll take a look at sextants and such like that. Any questions about this diagram? Let's clean it up just a little bit. Make sure you get it on your paper. If you can't draw the diagram, you're not, you can't understand it. You got to make sure you have all the details right. Parallel lines of light coming in, a vertical line through our position, us, to the center of the earth, a vertical line through the point directly, the light from the sun coming right down through the, the surface of the earth, continuing on to the center of the earth. So if Joe were here, that would be a vertical for him. And then the horizon here, we're measuring with the sextant, the angle from the horizon up to the sun, 50 degrees. And if that's 50 degrees, this is 90 minus the sextant reading, HS, 90 minus 50. The angle parallel lines, single line crossing, the angle at the center of the earth is 90 minus sextant reading, 90 minus 50, which is 40. And the distance from us to the point on the surface of the earth, we can measure distance here on the surface or at the center by an angle. Distance on the surface, 90 minus HS or 40 degrees. Okay, this is where it's, this is the whole subject really. Now you've got it. Now you just have to, the next diagram is simple. Next diagram is easy. We're just applying this information. This is where everything, this is why it works. This is the whole subject basically. Okay, well let's go on to the next diagram and you'll see why this has solved everything, basically everything we need to know um, to get a position. Okay, here we go. Next diagram. Diagram two. That was diagram one. Remember the three diagrams. The first, two, the first diagram is the most complicated. The second diagram, the one we're about to do, is really quite simple. I think you'll grasp this pretty quickly. The third diagram is just a trick. It's simply a trick to make it so we can use a small chart to do our final position is simply a trick. It took mankind quite a long time after they developed concepts of sextants and everything to learn this last, the last trick, the trick that we'll see in the third diagram. Um, and some people have a little bit of trouble because it's a trick. It's like, well, how can we do that? It just seems like a trick. Well, it is a trick, the third diagram. But the second diagram is fairly simple. Um, Okay, so let's look at the second diagram. Now, this time, we're doing a diagram. We're not slicing the earth at some funny angle. So we have a flat plate. That's what we did in the last diagram. We sliced through Northwest Washington and through someplace out in the Pacific and through the center of the earth, and we had a flat diagram. This time, we're gonna represent the earth as a round surface. So we can draw in, let's put in our North Pole here and our South Pole here and draw in our equator as a curved line like this. Okay, so this is a sphere. It comes, imagine it round. It's coming out from the board in a spherical way. Okay, now, we saw the sun. Let's Let's progress a little bit on our voyage. Let's move forwards a little bit on our voyage. Now we're not right off the coast of Northwest Washington. We're part way out to Hawaii. And our dead we've been dead reckoning, but after five, six days of sailing, and I know we're going, let's, we're going sort of the slow route to Hawaii because you go through the doldrums if you head straight there instead of going south and then up to, off to Hawaii. But let's just, let's just go ahead and go straight. So, we're, here's North America here. We're someplace in this area off of North America, and Hawaii is down over here someplace. So we're in the Pacific. <clears throat> let's take a morning sight on, let's take a sight on the easiest celestial body to shoot. And at this point, if I teach a class and I ask, what's the easiest body to shoot? Somebody's going to say, the North Star. And I love that. <laughs> Great answer. The North Star does have 
some limited navigational use because you can figure out your latitude from the North Star fairly simply, not, not exactly precisely unless you do a little bit more calculation, but uh, the North Star is hard to shoot because it's a third, it's not, not even a, th it's either third magnitude or beyond that. It's very faint, in other words. It's hard to shoot um, because when you're shooting a star, you have to be able to see the horizon. You're measuring up from the horizon to the star or up to the celestial body. Uh, the North Star barely emerges while you can still see the horizon because the sky is too light to see the North Star. And then the North Star is there, but you can't see the horizon. So the North Star is not used very often for navigation. Um, the easiest thing to shoot, because it's so easy to identify, a three-year-old can identify it, is, of course, the sun. There it is. And you can shoot the sun even when there's this light overcast where you wouldn't be able to shoot any stars because of the cloud cover. You can even shoot the sun through a light, light cloud cover. Um, and, so, and also it's during the day and the horizon's there all day. You can see this horizon all day long. You can shoot the sun anytime you want. Um, it doesn't have to be at that 15 minutes where the stars have emerged and you can see the stars and you can still see the horizon. So the sun is the easiest thing to navigate by. And um, so often on a trip, if you're short-handed, you might, the entire passage, just take one or two star sights, a um, uh, series of star sights once or twice during the passage, and the rest of your navigation might just be by sun sights. Um, when I sailed across the Atlantic in my 24-foot boat, uh, that was basically what I did. I took 90% of the sites were sun sites. Um, for fun I took some star and planet sites and star and planet sites you can take multiple sites at the same time uh, a whole series like five stars and planets. It gives you each one checks the first the other ones. Okay so uh, sun site. Let's take a sun site. Let's take a morning sun site. This is roughly where we are off the coast, partway to Hawaii. Uh, the morning sunset, the sun would be over here someplace, um, looking south east towards the sun. Now, let's say we got a sextant reading of 50 degrees, our HS, height sextant, equals 50 degrees when we shot the height of the sun. This is the point directly under the sun. If Joe were here, he would look straight up over his head and the sun would be coming right down on his head. Um, so the sun's position here and that sunlight would be going straight to the center of the earth. We are up here. We shot the height of the sun above the horizon and we got the height of the sun is 50 degrees above the horizon. Now, from our last diagram, we know the distance from the sun. We look up in the table the sun's latitude and longitude, we don't call them that because we don't want this to seem too simple. It actually is fairly simple, but we don't want it to seem simple. We call it declination and local hour, ang Greenwich hour angle in this case. Latitude and longitude, we're just going to call them declination and Greenwich hour angle just to make it a little bit more complicated. But it's actually just the latitude and longitude of the sun. Now, <clears throat> We don't know exactly where this point is, where we are. We don't know we're right there. We're just dead reckoning. Might be there, might be someplace in this area. Sort of a big area. Okay, but we know from our sextant reading our distance from this point directly under the sun. The distance is going to be 90 minus hs. That equals the distance, d, from this known point. Now how does that help us? Well, 90 minus HS, we've got an HS of 50, so we're 40 degrees away from this point. And that 40 degrees translates into 40 times 60 nautical miles, 2400 nautical miles. NM, nautical miles. Okay, 
Well, that defines a circle around that point, doesn't it? A circle with a diameter of 2400 nautical miles. And we have to be someplace on that circle. Okay? We could be anywhere on that circle based on that site, 2400 nautical miles away from Joe who is standing or on a boat or on shore or wherever, looking straight up at the sun. We're 2,400. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe, we're 2,400 nautical miles away from you right now. I'm not sure where we are, you know, but I know we're on the circle 2,400 nautical miles away from you. Okay. <clears throat> now, that's helpful, but not that helpful. Right? because that's a big circle, 2400 nautical mile uh, radius. So what's the next step? Well, the next step is wait till afternoon, stay still, don't go anywhere, stop your boat, wait till afternoon and take a sun sight after the sun has moved. The sun now has moved to the west and is over here. And we take another sun sight and this time we get NHS sub 2, second site, we get an HS of 70 degrees, of, uh, I'm sorry, 30 degrees, let's do 20 degrees. We waited pretty late in the afternoon, 20 degrees. That's about as low as we want to go. If you go down below 15 degrees, the light is bent so much by the atmosphere that your sight, even though you make a correction for that, an altitude correction for the bending of the light, below 15 degrees, the correction, depending on atmospheric, connect, correct, uh, atmospheric conditions, the correction is be pretty much sort of an approximation at that point. But at 20 degrees, we'll get a good sight still. The sun's getting pretty far down, 20 degrees. We shoot it our distance away, and then we look up in the nautical almanac for that minute and second that we took our section sight, and we get the latitude and longitude of the sun right at that point, late afternoon now, sun is low in the sky in the west, we got a section sighting of 20 degrees, our distance from the point, the latitude and longitude of the sun at that exact second that we took our sight is going to be 90, our distance from the sun will be 90 minus our sextant reading, 90 minus 20, that's 90 minus hs, right? That's our distance from the sun based on the first diagram. And that's, so 90 minus 20, that'll be 70 degrees away from the point under the sun. 70 times 60, 70 degrees times 60, 6 sevens is, 6 sevens is 54. 5,400 nautical miles away, 5,400 nautical miles away, and I think you can see where we're going with this. So now we have a big circle around that point that has a diameter of 5,400 nautical miles. And we're on that circle someplace, right? We have to be on this circle based on our second sextant reading in the late afternoon. Our distance, which tells us our distance from the point directly under the sun, the latitude and longitude of the sun at the exact minute and second that we took, our minute and second that we took our second sight. If we're on this circle, and we're on our first circle because we stayed still, we took down the sails, if we're on both circles, that means we either have to be here or here. And, um, if it's really hot, we're sweating, and in a bathing suit, we're probably down here, pretty close to the equator. If it's kind of chilly and we're thinking, oh, it's getting a little cool, I better put on a jacket, we're up here. You can probably tell which place you're at. In this case, we're up here. So that's it. You got it. You can navigate now. Two diagrams, and you can navigate. But, on a globe this size, the problem is that 
just a pencil line on this globe, we can do this, just measure those distances on the globe, and draw your arcs, your circles, and you'll have a position. The problem is that a pencil line on this size globe is probably about just the thickness, the width of the pencil line is probably about 60 nautical miles, or not 60, but the width of the pencil line might be 20 nautical miles or 30 nautical miles. Anyway, your accuracy is going to be pretty small, pretty low accuracy. If you get a globe that's 8 feet in diameter, you know, as tall as the ceiling in here, and you do this, you could probably get down to a mile accuracy. And that's close enough to sight an island, especially Hawaii, which is 13,000 13, feet tall. <clears throat> so this all works. But it's a little bit awkward. Right? My 34-foot boat, certainly in my 24-foot boat, I couldn't fit an 8-foot globe. It would have to be inflatable. That would be really awkward. It wouldn't fit in the cabin inflated. I'd have to be doing it on the deck and blow overboard like, overboard like a beach ball. It, it, it's a little impractical. Um, on my 34-foot boat, it would be impractical. On the 37-foot boat I'm building now, steel hull, beautiful cruise anywhere boat, uh, it would be impractical. So, that brings us to our third diagram, which is just a trick. The third diagram is a trick. We're going to pause here and look at sextants in a minute, but I'll just give you a hint about the third diagram. third diagram is just a trick to make the problem fit on a small nautical chart that doesn't extend as far as the position of the sun, or this could be a star or the planet, the point right under the sun, the sun or the star or the planet, and doesn't fit, this one's even farther away, 5400 nautical miles. If you shot we wouldn't need our trick if you shot something that was way up high and it fit on this chart. The ground point was on this little chart because the thing was way up high. You wouldn't need the trick of our third diagram. You could just do your circles right on the chart, circle around that point, circle around this point, and where the circles cross, that's your position. However, shooting things, we talked about shooting things that are too low, atmospheric distortion, stay above 15 degrees. Well, shooting things that are way high is really hard. You just don't do it because you can't tell where the horizon is. Something's way up here, 89 degrees. That would mean the ground point was 60 miles away from you, fit on the chart. 89 degrees. Where's the horizon? Is the horizon when I, over here, over here? Just physically, it's really, really, virtually impossible to get an accurate sighting up above. You know, I don't like to shoot above 75 degrees. 70 degrees is even better. You start getting way up high and your accuracy, you just don't, you can't do it. You don't know where the horizon is. And it doesn't, physically it's really hard to do. So, although it would work technically to get your celestial bodies way high so they fit on your chart, um, real, realistically, it's, it's not an option. So we have to figure out a trick where we can do this whole final part of the problem where the latitude and longitude of the sun are off the edge of the chart. Oh, now one more point. Uh, it was really irritating to have to take the sails down and stay in one place here, right? It was like we wasted the whole day. It was a great wind and waste the whole day. And that was so irritating. So let's not do that. Let's not stay in one place between these two sites. Now, of course, if it's star sites or planets and you're on a slow moving sailboat, uh, you can take all, you have to take all those sites fairly quickly because your horizon fades fairly quickly. You start your sights in the east because the western sky is still too bright to see any stars or planets. You start your sights in the east where the stars emerge first and you can still see your horizon and you take those sights around the east and you finish up 
after that eastern horizon has become so dark you can't see the horizon anymore, the stars are bright but you can't see the horizon, you finish up shooting to the west where the horizon is still illuminated and now those stars have emerged because the sun is, the sunlight is, the sun's set and the sunlight is diminished. You can still see your horizon. So you realistically you have uh, <clears throat> ideally like a 15 minute window more, you know, really you probably can extend that to half an hour window to take stars right when they emerge in the east, moving around to taking your stars in the west. And that could be stars around, moving around to the south and the north as you move around to the west. But the sun sights you can take any time during the day. Um, so star sights, you can take five sights and they can all be within 15-20 minutes of each other or even closer, maybe within five minutes if you're fast with your sexton. Um, and you don't have to worry about staying, how much you move during those sights. But with the sun sight, where you sail the whole day from a morning sight until the afternoon, covered lots of miles, great wind, you're flying along, well, that would make this whole problem less accurate because you no longer were in the same place when you took the sights. So what we do, let's get rid of this box, what we do is we just take this first problem here and move the entire thing whatever direction we sailed. Let's say we we're sailing southeast. We just, and sailing southeast at five knots for six hours. We just take this whole problem and move the whole problem southeast Five times six, 30 nautical miles. We just move the whole problem 30 nautical miles to the southeast. Or let's say we're sailing south, we move the whole problem south. And then when we do our two circles, because we advanced the first sight, when we do our two circles, we do have an accurate position. Okay? So that's called advancing your sight. And you just use dead reckoning uh, for that advancing. If your dead reckoning is off by a mile, your final position will be off by a mile. But that's not a big error. Okay, so our third diagram is going to be the trick, and then you'll have the whole picture. So take a look. Might be a good time to review your first diagram. That first diagram explains why our distance from the point directly under the sun, or star, or planet is 90 minus the sextant reading, 90 minus hs. That's all the first diagram does. Our distance, any planet we shoot, any sun we shoot, our distance from that point is 90 minus the height of that planet above the horizon. 90 minus the sextant reading. That's all the first diagram does. The second diagram shows how we use that information. The distance is from the point that we know the known point underneath the sun or planet. The distance from that point describes a circle and we have to be on that circle. That circle is an LOP, line of position. And that's LOP1 and this is LOP2. If we're on the first circle and we're on the second circle, we have to be where they cross here. Okay. And if you take star sites or planets, you can take multiple ones. You can take five sites. And that gives you multiple LOPs, multiple circles around the ground point of each individual star or planet that you shot. And those multiple, let's put another one, pretty high one. This was a high shot. Uh, so that circle would be here. Now you have multiple LOPs crossing and they should all, ideally, cross exactly at the same point. Realistically, they're not going to. Maybe you have one that's like 20 miles away from four of them cross within half a mile of each other. Really good sights. Um, and then one crosses is someplace 20 miles away. You say, well, that one I'm going to throw out because I think, you know, a, a wave you know, tossed the boat a little bit, and I didn't feel that was a very good sight. And it wasn't. It was 20 miles off. How did I do that? I don't know. I blew it. 
Um, the other ones are all crossing within half a mile. That's the reason for star and planet sites. Each one, you, the first two define your position. Each one after that is checking those first two and just reaffirming that that is where you are and telling you how accurate those sites are. Oh, they all crossed within half a mile. It was pretty flat seas and really calm and I got really good sights. Oh, this sort of defining a mile wide area of where I might be in. That's because the, you know, it's kind of rough or I was using a plastic section. Let's look at the sections in fact. I think we're at that stage. Any questions so far? Look at these two diagrams. Maybe even pause right now. Look at your first diagram. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you have it right. Maybe back, back up to the picture of the first diagram. Make sure you have it right. Um, look at your second diagram. Make sure you have it right. And if you can find somebody to explain this to and show them, take a blank sheet of paper, say, I'm going to teach you celestial navigation. It's really simple. Here's the first diagram. If you can draw it and explain it to them, you'll know it for the rest of your life. It's a simple diagram. And then take the second, turn the paper over, do the second diagram. So here's, here's why that works and makes it so we can navigate. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, the equipment we're going to use. We have it over here. I guess the fun stuff is the sextants. Let's look at sextants first. This is the starting point. Um, this is an emergency sextant. This is your backup emergency sextant that you never use. You're never going to use this. Accuracy is probably five miles with this sextant. <clears throat> you know, in relatively good conditions. Um, that's not too bad. If you know where you are within five miles and you're crossing an ocean, that's that's going to work. So not too bad. It's not too bad. If you are on a really low budget, get two of these. Um, one a backup and one for your primary, and you'll be within five miles. Um, but the next step is probably is also pretty affordable. The next step up is uh, this level. And this is a plastic sexton, but it's a little bit more precise. You uh, have the vernier knob here for adjusting and reads off a little bit more precisely. <coughs> the uh, filters are a little bit better. Remember, remember when you're shooting the sun, you have to have the right filters or else you'll burn your eye. If you're looking through a telescope <coughs> at the sun, uh, it's dangerous if you don't have filters. You will do permanent damage. So be very careful with filters. Uh, to use the filters, let me talk about the telescope for a minute, and then we'll talk about the filters. The telescope increases your level of accuracy um, because it's very precise looking at the sun or at a star through the telescope. The trouble with the telescope, with the sun it's not a problem because <clears throat> it's pretty easy to find the sun. With a star, the trouble with the telescope is the telescope narrows your field of view. So it's harder to find the star. It's harder to search it out. Um, so sometimes you might shoot stars with just an open scope. And most sextants will have a scope. Looks like a telescope, but there's nothing in it. It's just hollow. You're just looking through an eyepiece. Um, or a telescope. So you have both options. So sometimes with stars and planets, it's easier to use an open scope, even though it's slightly less accurate than a telescope. Um, and if you're using a telescope especially, but really any time, I just do it automatically because it's so much easier. Any time you're shooting something, it's pretty hard to find it by cranking, by adjusting the sextant. Sextant works this way. One line of sight, the straight line of sight, goes straight through to the horizon. The other line of sight goes through the eyepiece, hits the mirror here, bounces off, hits this mirror, and goes up to the, sex, to the star or planet, or the sun. And so you're measuring the angle between the horizon and the direction to the sun or planet or star, the celestial body. So horizon, celestial body, light goes straight through your eye 
sight goes straight through to the horizon, bounces it off this mirror and this mirror up to this uh, celestial body. Um, so by looking through here, you can find the horizon easily, you're looking right at it. But to find the star or planet by adjusting this is pretty darn hard. So take it and flip your section upside down and look straight at the sun or straight at the star. If it's the sun, make sure your filters are in place these lower filters, okay? Look straight at the celestial body, find it in the telescope or in the eyepiece, and then adjust downwards until the horizon appears. Horizon's really obvious, you can't miss it, okay? And then set it fairly accurately with the star or planet sitting on the horizon. Now, it's hard to get an accurate sight upside down like this. So at this point, flip your sextant over now, look straight at the horizon, and your star, when you're pointing in the right direction, your star will be right in your mirror. Okay, so you found your star now. That's the first thing. Now, the next thing is to get an accurate sight. That's not so easy on a small boat, because the waves are bouncing and everything. So you kind of have to grab your sight. Now, the easiest way to take a sight is to set your sextant so the sun or star or planet is slightly, if it's rising on the ascendancy, so the sun or star or planet is slightly below the horizon and just very slightly below it and just keep watching it until now it's right on the horizon. Mark! And either you're doing it yourself with a stopwatch, you push your stopwatch right when it touches the horizon, or you say mark and the other person, your partner, records the exact time that it touched, that you said mark, and it touched the horizon. Now, one of the problems with a sextant is if you're holding the sextant at a funny angle, you're not measuring accurately the height of the star. You're measuring from up here down to a point over here, and you're getting too big a reading. You have to have it straight down. Now, it's hard to know whether you're holding the sextant at a funny angle or straight down. So what we do with a sextant is we rock it. We keep the star or planet in the viewfinder, the light coming down through the mirrors. We keep the star or planet in the viewfinder, rocking the sextant. A little tricky to do that, keeping the star right in the mirrors. And now the star is doing this dip over the horizon. And we can look at that. I think you've got all this. So let's take a look what it looks like through the sextant. And this is, you know, this takes a little skill. It takes a lot of skill if it's rough and you're in a small boat, like a 24-foot boat, the boat I sailed across the Atlantic in. Uh, it takes a fair amount of skill, um, and your accuracy is not going to be quite as good. But basically what you're doing is rocking it so the star is doing this kind of thing. Back and forth. And this is right where you say mark, right when the star hits that. Initially the star is rising, and then initially you start with the star doing this kind of thing below the horizon. And remarkably, in an arc like this, below the horizon, <coughs> remarkably fast, through a telescope especially, these stars and planets, they move, they're shooting along, they move, you're like, whoa, can't keep up with it. Um, so, remarkably fast, that star will get up to this point, and then all of a sudden it'll be above the horizon, and you've missed it, and you've got to crank back down if, you're gonna, if you didn't get your sight right here. Um, so, uh, that rocking, you just keep rocking until it just is kissing the horizon right there. If it's the sun, this is one of the details we'll get into a little bit later. If it's the sun or the moon, it's no longer just a single point. The table actually <clears throat> tells us different numbers for the sun if we shoot the lower limb of the sun or if we shoot the upper limb of the sun. Whoopsie. Sun changed sizes there dramatically. Lower limb of the sun, sun sitting on the horizon, just kissing the horizon. Upper limb of the sun, just kissing the horizon, the top of the sun. And again, you'd be doing this thing of rocking the sextant, so the sun would be doing its, that would be shooting the upper limb. It's usually easier to shoot the lower limb, though. Usually it's just somehow visually easier to sh set the sun on the horizon instead of setting the top of the sun kissing the horizon, but either one's Either one's fine. Same with the moon, where 
lower li lower limb, upper limb. <clears throat> okay, um, remember, if you're shooting the sun, when you flip your sextant over, get your filters right. You have to change to the upper filters or else you'll burn your eye. You really will burn your retina looking at the sun through a telescope, even for a second. Uh, so make sure your filters are right. Um, be careful with air sextants, bubble sextants, because they're like a camera all enclosed and you just flip this, you just turn this knob and the filters flip in front and so you, be careful if it's one of the ones where you go from darker filter, darker, 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 and then you flip one more and there's no filter. You'll burn your eye that way, so be careful with the sun. Okay, to use the filters now, um, it's hard to adjust the filters looking through the telescope at the thing because you're trying to keep the thing, you know, you're trying to keep the sun in the mirrors and stuff. So you want to use your filters this way. You take your filters and you look right through the, all the filters at the sun. Ooh, I can't hardly see it. I can't see anything. Flip one down. Oh, that's a little too bright. Flip that one back up. Flip a different one down. Just keep adjusting until looking straight at the sun through the filters without the telescope or any other part of the section, you've got it so it's comfortable for your eye. Then flip those filters into place in front of the mirrors. It usually be three filters um, and one out of the way. And then go ahead and do your sighting. Um, but make sure you have the right filters in place for the sun. With stars, of course, no filters at all. Unless, the reason there's so many filters, not just one sun filter, unless you're shooting something like Venus, and, uh, or a dim star, actually it would be a, more like a dim star, sorry, uh, you're shooting a dim star to the, no, you're shooting a bright star, <laughs> let's get this straight, you're shooting a bright star with a dim horizon. And you might want to filter the star with one filter, just very slightly, so you can still see the horizon. Or it could be the other way around. You're shooting a dim star with a bright horizon. Then you'd use the horizon filters here. Um, so a dim star, you want to make your horizon a little bit darker, you're straight through, so you can see the dim star a little easier. So you might use one filter on your horizon. So mostly the filters are for the sun, Occasionally there's a situation where you'd use it for a star, a dim star, or a bright horizon. Okay, um, now the other sextants. Now we go top of the line. And this is a beautiful instrument. Now one thing about sextants, um, in fact I might have even commented on this at the beginning of this segment, but if you're watching it and you've watched it this far, um, you probably agree. Uh, unless you're some kind of electronic wi wizard, if your GPS stops working, it's time to take it and chuck it overboard. Because you're probably, you take it apart, you're not probably going to be able to fix it. Maybe if it's just the on-off switch or corrosion in the battery area, battery holding compartment or something, or some wiring connection, maybe you can remedy it. But um, if it's an electronic thing inside this GPS that's stopped, or if suddenly we're, you're in the ocean and we're at war and the GPS has been uh, code of, uh, um, switched around so it's encoded so only the U.S. military can use it, you're going to be out of luck. Um, yes, backup GPSs are a great idea, but still, unless you somehow know what's happening inside that box and how to fix it, you're going to be out of luck when it stops working. Whereas a sextant, I mean the worst case, seriously the worst case scenario with a sextant is you drop it overboard and it's gone and you didn't have, and that was your backup one, you'd already, already lost your real one, you've lost two of them now. Um, pretty unlikely. Um, your worst case scenario is you can take your paper and pencil and still do a site that will give you some idea of where you are. Just Look along the bottom of the paper and aim your pencil at the star or planet. This is emergency navigation. This is lifeboat navigation. And angle the pencil until it's pointing, your paper is pointing right at the bottom edge of the paper, it's pointing right at the horizon. 
pencil is pointing right at the star or moon or bottom edge of the moon or the bottom edge of the sun and then hold it still draw that line along there measure the angle and you're going to have a 30 mile accuracy 20 30 mile accuracy you can still hit you can still find hawaii you're not going to sail right past hawaii so sextants and you know ways of measuring the height of a body are repairable you bend your sextant you can bend it back okay you drop it and it's like oh my god i bend it bend the thing back it's not like a gps where you toss it um and you've got your emergency sextant maybe you have three sextants on board uh these these little ones are you know in the 40 50 dollar range and if you find it on ebay it's in the 10 dollar range and it's it's lifetime never wears out no batteries last forever um okay so now this is a high-end sextant um with the first section the emergency section we we're talking with paper and pencil we're talking about 20 mile accuracy maybe 30, 30 mile accuracy with the emergency section we're talking about five mile accuracy with the better plastic section we're talking about one mile accuracy and all these depend on relatively moderate sea conditions with a high-end section we're talking about half mile accuracy uh that's that's pretty accurate um for crossing an ocean using stars that are minimum of four four point two four light years away pretty amazing stuff um so and this is a beautiful piece of art i mean it's a beautiful beautiful piece of equipment um fun to display it in your home it's just gorgeous it's fun to use pushing a button on a gps is not all that exciting this is exciting because it's something beautiful if it were not so heavy, you could wear it as a piece of jewelry. It's really lovely. Um, so a high-end sextant is a nice possession. It'll last a lifetime. Never wear out. Never, never degrade. Um, telescope, filters, everything's the same. <clears throat> All works the same, just works a little smoother. A little more accurate. Um, vernier, you have to learn how to read the vernier thing, but that's not too hard. Um, now, the only negative of a really good section is this weighs approximately five times as much as the plastic section. Um, if you're having a hard time getting a sight because it's rough and it's, you keep getting, losing your balance, you're getting thrown sideways every time you're about to get it, your arm your arms starts to get pretty tired with this section. And just holding it up like this, just talking, it's heavy. Um, so in a small boat, you may actually be better off with a light plastic sextant rather than a heavier metal sextant, despite the, your accuracy with the plastic one because of the lightness may actually be better than your accuracy with the heavy, more precise metal one. So, um, not to feel badly if you don't want to put 500 or a thousand dollars into a metal sextant, just get a mid range plastic one for a couple hundred bucks. Okay. So that's sextants. And then let's look at tables briefly here, and then we'll get on to our last diagram. Okay, tables. We talked briefly about the nautical almanac. You can find this online. You can look at it. It tells you, essentially what it does is tells you the latitude and longitude, which we call declination for latitude, just so we, you know, can confuse everyone, basically. Uh, declination and latitude are exactly the same. Declination north or south, just like latitude north and south. Um, declination and Greenwich hour angle, which in our western hemisphere is exactly the same as longitude. The only difference with Greenwich hour angle and longitude is Greenwich hour angle is measured from Greenwich, England all the way around 360 degrees in one direction um, measuring from east to west all the way around 360 degrees whereas you remember longitude is measured 180 degrees around to the west and 180 around to the east greenwich hour angle makes more sense than longitude actually so we just have to but as long as we're in the western hemisphere 
um, Greenwich hour angle is exactly the same as longitude. The Greenwich hour angle of a star or planet is the longitude of the star or planet in the Western Hemisphere. In the Eastern Hemisphere, you just have to remember that they're measured differently. One all the way around, Greenwich hour angle all the way around, longitude around halfway, 180 degrees, and around the other way, 180 degrees. Okay, so that's the nautical almanac. Tells you the declination and Greenwich hour angle, basically latitude and longitude, of every star and planet in the sky um, that we can use for navigation. 30 navigational stars, the sun, the moon, and all the planets for every second of the year that the almanac has been written for. Okay, so that's the first piece of information you're going to get uh, is out of the Nautical Almanac. Now, the second book that we use is the site reduction tables. This does all the, t all the tough math for you. This does all the spherical trigonometry that we haven't seen yet because we haven't needed it yet. All the, all the math and everything has been really simple so far, just 90 minus HS, subtraction. Sextant reading 50 degrees, our distance from the star or planet's point, latitude and longitude underneath the star and planet, 90 minus HS, 90 minus 50, that's 40, 40 times 60 nautical miles, 2400 nautical miles. Oh, we need multiplication. Well, so what? You can do that. Okay. But for the last diagram, the third diagram, the trick, we're going to be using this a little bit. <clears throat> this is going to help us get everything, the whole problem, onto a little chart, a little nautical chart, instead of the trouble with using a huge nautical chart that covers so much of the Earth that the sun or planet's ground point, the point directly under the sun or planet or the stars, is going to be on that big chart. The trouble with that is any time you take the round surface of the Earth and project it onto a flat surface, you're going to get distortions. Um, you can't just flatten it out. So a Mercator projection of a huge part of the ocean, <clears throat> you can't do your problem on that, just measuring distances cause, and directions, because it'll distort it. Uh, you'd have to do that on a globe, and then it would work out accurately. But this is part of the third diagram. We'll use numbers. We'll go into this to get the information we need for our third diagram. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's, this is HO229. HO229. And we have several versions of site reduction tables that we can use. This is HO249, the air navigation tables. You can use this. This one volume covers the entire surface of the Earth, but it's not as accurate. <clears throat> and a little bit, few, more, a couple more steps to using this. This covers 15 degrees of latitude. So you need several volumes of this. Um, for the latitudes you're going to be most normally sailing in, you probably need three volumes of this, possibly four volumes if you get farther north. So um, you need several volumes of this or one volume of this, but this is the easier one to use. HO229, site reduction tables for marine, marine navigation. Okay, and there are actually, there's another version of, the marine navigation, um, but that's HO214. Uh, Basically works in a similar way. Once you understand it, you can use either one, but 229 is the standard. Okay, uh, and the last thing is the third diagram. We'll get on to the third diagram here very shortly. Thank you. Okay, now. Big question, was anyone bothered by this diagram, this picture here? Well, you should have been a little bit bothered by it. It looks very nice, symmetrical like that and everything. But, in reality, it doesn't happen this way. It can't happen this way. Uh, the lower limb picture is correct, arcing the sextant, swinging the sextant. And you might have noticed, in swinging the sextant, that the part that's staying stationary is the upper mirror. 
is not the eyepiece. That's the trick. You have to pivot around this point here. So that's what's staying stationary. That's why it's a little tricky to do it. You can't do it like this because you lose the star. You have to pivot it like this with this upper mirror staying stationary, keeping the star in the viewfinder. Okay, um, so lower limb shot shooting the bottom of the star, the sun or moon, and that is correct. Just sweeping over the horizon. But this upper limb shot, actually this would be nice if it worked this way because it would make the upper limb a lot easier to shoot, but it doesn't work this way. You can't do an arc like that. So let's look at the upper limb again really quickly. So this is the lower limb sweeping down over the horizon till the bottom edge of the sun or the moon just barely touches the horizon. An upper limb shot will look like this. And this is why we don't like the upper limb as well, because it's a little trickier. That's the upper limb shot. This is the horizon here. So the upper limb, this, the sun or the moon, is sweeping below the horizon, and the top is just barely kissing the horizon here. And it's just not as clean because you're sweeping through the horizon on your arc. And so just a little, little trickier. And I would never take an upper limb shot except with the moon, occasionally it's your only option. If the moon is a partial moon like that, you only have an upper limb. And so you would take the upper limb. Occasionally, technically, if the sun is partly, partly occluded by a cloud, you could take an upper limb shot of the sun, but it's better just to wait two minutes and take a lower limb when the lower limb, when the cloud moves. But with the moon, sometimes you have to take an upper limb. It's, a, it's not that usual though. It's a little trickier, but it still works. Okay, now our third diagram, third and final diagram to understand the whole concept of celestial navigation. Remember our first diagram told us that the distance that we are from the ground point, the point directly under the sun or the celestial body that we shot, the distance is 90 minus our sextant reading, 90 minus HS. There are some small corrections we make on the sextant reading to make it more accurate. But basically, our distance from the point directly under the sun or planet or star is 90 minus our sextant reading. Our second diagram showed us that we could do two, one circle, that defines one circle around the ground point, and that tells us we're on that circle someplace, that's a line of position that circle, and then by taking a second sight, we have a second line of position, a second circle around that second position of the new celestial body, or the same celestial body when it's moved. That gives us a second line of position where those two lines cross, that's our location. Okay, now the third diagram gets everything, it's just a trick. This is the trick, and people object to it. Well, how can that work? Well, it's a trick, and it's a trick that works. It's pretty nifty, actually. And it took a long time for anybody to come up with this. So this diagram gets us onto a chart. A chart that includes our location, but does not include the location, the position of the sun or planet or whatever we shot. So we're someplace up in this area here, but the ground point of the sun or planet is way, way off the chart. Maybe, you know, a thousand miles off the chart. So how are we going to do the problem if we don't have this on our chart and can draw a circle around that point? It's off the chart. So what are we going to do? Well, the starting point is kind of like pin the tail on the donkey. Just kind of make a random point. Oh, here. Let's say, let's say, let's pretend we're there. 
We don't know if we're there. We might be over here or anywhere on here. Let's just pretend we're here. Let's assume we're there. Let's call this an assumed position. Let's even label it AP. We don't know if we're there. Maybe we're there, but probably not. We just picked a point. Okay, now, if we have an AP, a point on the chart, we can look at the chart and find out its latitude and its longitude. A known point now, latitude, longitude. We have a known point here. We have a second known point, which is off the chart, but way off the chart, thousands of miles maybe. And we have the latitude and longitude for that second point. We have two known points on the face of the Earth. We're off in the Pacific someplace. Our position and the position of the sun, way, way down south, southeast, we took it in the morning. Two known points. From that, we should be able to figure out, we should be able to measure the distance between those two points. Or, if we use a table, we can go into a table that's designed for this, and the table will tell us the distance from this latitude and longitude to this latitude and longitude. If we know the distance between this point and this point, how does that help us? We're not really here. Why do we want to know the distance between the point directly under the sun, the ground point of the sun, latitude and longitude, and the point where we're not even there? We just picked a point on the chart at random. Well, here it is. Maybe you're guessing ahead of me. Maybe you've jumped ahead and can see this. Well, if we know the distance between this assumed point and the actual ground point of the sun, or let's say the sun, actual ground point of the sun right when we took our sight, if we know the distance, we can calculate very easily the sextant reading we would have gotten if we were here. So, remember that the distance to the ground point is 90 minus our sextant reading. That's from our first diagram. So, the sextant reading is that we would have gotten if we were here would just be 90 minus the distance between those two points. So, we know the two points. We know what sextant reading we should have gotten if we were here. Just from the table, because we entered the latitude and longitude of our assumed position, the latitude and longitude of the ground point under the sun, right at that second that we took our sight, and the table computed the distance and then actually did the subtraction for us, 90 minus the distance, and gave us an height computed, HC, height computed, computed the sextant reading that we would have gotten if we had been right at this point, right when we took our sight. Okay, and if that sextant reading happens to be exactly the same as the sextant reading we actually got, our height sextant that we shot with our sextant, if those two are the same, we might be right on that point. However, we might not be on that point, too. We might be someplace else. Where else could we be? If they were both the same, the height that we computed, if we had been here, and the height we actually got, we could be at that point. But remember, the distance from the ground point defines a circle around the location of the star. A circle around that location of the star. So we could be anywhere on this circle if our height computed was actually the same as the height that we read on the sextant. Okay, let's look at this just a little bit longer here and then we'll take the next step. The table, since it knows our latitude and longitude and the latitude and longitude of the ground point of the star, 
It can also, it can tell us the distance between the two, and then it can turn that into what sextant reading we would have gotten, just 90 minus the distance. And it can tell us the direction from our latitude and longitude, our position, to the other position, the position under the sun. It can tell us the direction right towards the sun when we shot it, because it knows those two points, two physical points. This is just the assumed position, not our real position, but if we had been here, the direction to the sun would have been this direction. It'll tell us, in this, in this case, southeast. It'll tell us exactly, in a, you know, how many degrees. What is that? That's uh, 90 degrees, so that looks like another 40 degrees. So, 130 degrees here. It'll tell us that, 130 degrees. That, that's the way the sun would have been, what direction the sun would have been if we'd been there. Okay, and then this circle, right where the circle goes through our position, would be at 90 degrees to that. Because this points right to the sun, that's the sun over here, way off the chart, and the circle, this is like a radian pointing towards the sun, and the circle would be around the sun, and we'd be someplace on that circle, L-O-P. But, yes, you're right, we weren't there, and it's pretty, pretty unlikely that we just guessed a point with our eyes closed where the sextant reading we would have gotten here was exactly the computed sextant reading as if we had been there. That's pretty unlikely. It's more likely that HS, the sextant reading we got, isn't the same as the computed sextant reading for this point. And so it means we're not there. So what do we do? Just keep trying points, you know, all over the place? You know, here, 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 here. Oh, none of them are right. None of them are the sextant reading we got. For none, for none of these assumed positions come out with a computed sextant reading that is exactly the same as our sextant reading. Well, that would take hours to just keep guessing and being wrong, wrong, wrong. So, what can we do that's going to simplify things? Let's clean up our diagram first. Okay, turns out that our sextant reading was not the same as the sextant reading we should have gotten if we'd been here. Our sextant reading, let's put some numbers into this. Our sextant reading was, let's say, 30 degrees. If we had been at this point, our sextant reading would have been computed by the tables for this latitude and longitude and the other latitude and longitude of the sun. Our sextant reading would have been 31 degrees. So, we aren't at this point. We can't be at this point. We're not even on a circle through that point. We're either closer to the sun or farther from the sun. The computed for this position is 31 degrees. Our sextant reading was less. That means the sun was lower. And since the sun's... Now, this is where you have to be careful. Since the sun was lower in the sky, that means what? It means we we're closer to the sun or farther away from the sun. As the sun gets higher and higher, we're closer to the sun. As the sun gets lower and lower, we're farther away from the sun. When the sun's directly overhead, it's a really high reading. So, when the height computed is higher, we are farther away because our section site was lower. That means the sun was lower and we are farther away from the sun. So, we're not here. Does that mean that we are one degree farther away, 60 miles farther away from that point? One degree farther away, 60 nautical miles farther away? 
Well, it could mean that we're there, but remember, what we're defining is a distance from a point which actually is an arc of a circle. So now we can draw an arc of a circle that is one degree farther away from the sun than this assumed position. So one degree further out. As the sun gets, as our sextant angle gets lower and lower, that means we're farther and farther away, farther and farther back from the sun. So one degree farther, one degree difference between the computed sextant reading that we would have gotten if we'd been here, and the actual sextant reading means we're one degree farther out. Now this is sometimes hard to think this one out, but you can just remember, this is a, there's just a cheat system for this. See, Coast Guard Academy, CGA. Coast Guard Academy, computed greater away. If the height computed is greater than the actual sighting height, then you're farther away from the sun. Computed greater away. So we're one degree farther away from the point here, the assumed position, and then and we know the direction to the sun from this assumed position. So our circle, which defines our position, is going to be perpendicular to the direction to the sun because it's a big circle around the sun. And we can draw an arc through that point there. And we have to be someplace on this arc, someplace on that LOP. Okay? So we have to find... We're not here, we just chose any random point for our assumed position, doesn't matter. If we chose chosen an assumed position here, our difference between our sextant reading and the height computed for this position would have been more like two and a half degrees, which would have been 140 miles or something, 150 miles. It doesn't matter what assumed position we choose, it's all going to work. Any assumed position, assumed position here, would have been a different direction to the sun and a bigger difference between the computed sextant reading and the actual sextant reading. And we would have come out to the same LOP, same perpendicular line, and we'd be on that line. Okay, but in reality, to draw, we don't know exactly how to draw this curve, do we? We don't know how to draw a curved LOP here. Well, not a big problem, because we have shrunk this, we've moved in so close, we've zoomed in so close on this problem to get it on the chart, that this curved line, essentially, at this point, we're taking such a small part of that huge arc that essentially it's a good enough approximation to draw that as a straight line that is perpendicular. Let's get perpendicular to our first sight. That is perpendicular to the direction to the, to the sun or planet. Okay? Um, obviously not going to be perpendicular to all these. Now, as we get farther and farther away, our assumed position farther and farther away, from our actual position, we start to get into a bit of an error because we're making a straight line out of a curved line. So the closer our assumed position is to our actual position, the more accurate all of this is. So rather than choose an assumed, our dead reckoning position, let's say, is up in here someplace. Let's choose an assumed position close to our dead reckoning position because then we'll have a higher level of accuracy and our LOP will be better LOP. If we choose any assumed position on the chart, it'll still work, but we're introducing a, a level of accuracy that's less, less accurate. Okay, so we'll choose an AP assumed position that's fairly close to our, la our actual dead reckoning position and we'll get rid of these other ones. Okay. Any problems with that?
let's, this is the trick. The part that bothers people is that we aren't actually here. We just chose a point on the map, on the chart. And it doesn't have to be very accurate, but the more accurate it is, the better your problem, you know, the, the closer your problem will work out to your actual position. Okay, let's redraw this quickly. And let's choose an assumed position over here in this area. And then we worked out the site and everything. And with our, we have the latitude and longitude of our assumed position. We have the latitude and longitude of the sun when we shot it. The direction to the sun turns out from the table to be like that, southeast, a little south-southeast. And the, um, let's stick with these same numbers here, where the height computed was 31 degrees. If we'd been here at our AP and computed the distance to the sun, its ground point, its GP, we would have gotten... Uh, if we actually measured the distance, we would have gotten 90 minus the distance and then corrected and then come out with our height computer. Uh, let's say we'd gotten, um, what's that, 60s, uh, 59. The distance would be 59 degrees, D equals 59 degrees. Then the table does the math for us and tells us Having figured out the distance first, the table then does the math for us, takes 90 minus the distance, and gets the actual sextant reading we should have gotten, we would have gotten, if we'd been at this location, this latitude and longitude. Now the height sextant was different by one degree, so we just take the latitude scale and take one degree on the latitude scale and go take that distance, go away one degree, 60 nautical miles, and make a point, and then do a perpendicular to that point, to that line towards the sun, and then we draw a line of position approximating the curve around the sun with a straight line, and this is our LOP1. That doesn't tell us exactly where we are, just that we're on that line. Okay, now the next step, I think you can see ahead. Let's get a little space here. The next step is to do a second site. If it's the sun we're working with, if we did a second site a half hour later, our new direction wouldn't be much different. The sun wouldn't have moved very far and we'd get an LOP that crossed at a very slight angle here. When two LOPs cross at a slight angle, if one of them's off by half a mile, it moves the juncture point quite a long way. It could move it like five miles just because you had a half mile uh, inaccuracy in your sight. So let's not take the sun sight an hour later. Let's wait until afternoon and then take our second sight. Let's wait until the sun has moved way over to this direction here. Again, it's way off our chart, way down near the floor someplace, or even in the basement, way down. Um, so we can't get the sun position on our chart. If we could get the sun's position on the chart, then we just do a circle around it. That would be our LOP, 90 minus HS. This would be the distance to the circle and we'd be at the two crossing points. But we can't get the sun's position on our chart. The chart's not big enough. Sun's way off. Choose an AP, anywhere. Doesn't have to be the same AP as this. It's not likely to be the same AP as this, actually. Um, although if you use this AP, it would still work. Um, any AP, doesn't have to be the same. You, it's going to be a different AP in most cases. Um, let's use this as our AP too. It has a latitude and longitude, right? We just made a point on the chart. Check the latitude, check the longitude. Oh, now we have a latitude and longitude of a guessed position again. We're not here, we're just guessing. Okay, now we have a direction to the sun. Let's say it's uh, early afternoon, the sun is south-southeast, uh, south-southwest, that direction. And 
we have an HS, sun was higher now, uh, height sextant of 42 degrees. That's what we read off our section, 42 degrees. We computed the distance, the tables computed, we entered the latitude and longitude of the sun, which is way off down there. The latitude and longitude of the sun, we entered the latitude and longitude of our guest assumed position. And the table worked out the distance between the two and then turned that into the sextant reading just by 90 minus the distance. And gave us a sextant reading that we would have gotten of 41 degrees. Okay, there's a one degree difference. That means we're not, we can't be at that point. We have to be someplace else. We can't be at this point because the sextant reading that we computed for this point isn't the same as the sextant reading we got. Well, the computed sextant reading is 41 degrees. Ours is 42 degrees. Ours is higher. That means as we get higher, we get closer and closer, right? Ours is higher than the computed for this position. The computed for this position is 41, ours is 42. That means we, got, we were closer than that position because the sun was higher. So we measure latitude, one degree of latitude here. Take that one degree and draw a line across the direction to the sun and then a perpendicular to that direction towards the sun that also the table told us when we entered the table with the latitude and longitude of our position and the latitude and longitude of the ground point of the sun. The direction, perpendicular to the direction, and then draw a straight line through that point and that's our new LOP, LOP2. And we're on that line someplace. We've got to be on this line and we know we're on LOP1 as well, we're on that line, and so we have to be where the two lines cross right there. And that's our actual fix. And you put the time and date right beside that. Okay? So these two lines crossing, LOP1, LOP2, make our position here. Now if we were shooting stars or something, we could get a third sight, and that would make another line, another LOP, and hopefully it would cross within half a mile of these first two, and we'd be within the triangle of those crossing LOPs. But with two LOPs, you have a position. You have a, a definite position. So that is our actual location. Now, there are some refinements in this, but this is the basic concept. One of the problems that may not have occurred to you yet, is that it's hard to create a table where you enter with four different variables. The latitude, our assumed position latitude, our assumed position longitude, and the assumed position, or the um, actual ground position latitude and the ground position longitude of the sun. That's four different numbers. It's hard to enter a table with four numbers. So somehow we're going to have to combine some of those numbers and do the problem, simplify it for the table. And the same with this one here. We'll have to combine some things and get it down to three things we enter the table with. But basically this is how it all works. Okay? Is this clear? Any questions about this? You just grab a position, any position, and say, what's the sextant reading I would have got at this latitude and longitude? If your sextant reading is different, the actual sextant reading you got is different from the computed sextant reading in the table. You're not at that point. You're either farther from the sun or closer to the sun. You move the right direction, distance away based on the difference between the height computed and the height sextant. You either move towards or away, remember the CGA, Com Coast Guard Academy, computed, great, what's the, computed greater away. If the computed sextant reading is greater, as in the first case, 43, computed greater than the actual, 
you can remove away. If the computed, and that's what we did here, we moved away one degree. If the computed is less, then it's the opposite of computed greater away, and you're going to move towards the sun. Okay, remember these LOPs are straight lines on our diagram, but they're actually just grand circles, huge circles around the position, around the latitude of the ground point. Huge circle around the latitude, latitude and longitude of the ground point. Okay, so that's really the third diagram. If you can get this and remember the first two diagrams, that's all there is to celestial navigation, except a few details that we can fill in. Once you understand what you're doing, then the tables are relatively easy to use. The um, table that we're using to get these critical numbers, the height computed based on the latitude and longitude of our assumed position and the latitude and longitude of the ground point, is the site reduction tables. And these have all the information you need. They tell you the height computed and the direction. There are a few details that we need to go over to make this really clear. I can give you a hint about those, but that's really part two of the talk. Um, I'll give you a few hints though, and then we'll go, then you'll know what's ahead, even though we won't explain it totally in depth, but you can sort of look forwards to the next part. Now, Let's take one of these lines out, our second LOP out, our second site, all the information from our second site. Oh, well, before we go into these details, I know there's going to be one question here. So let's put this back in, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll put this second site back in. Um, I think we're towards on this one. Here's our AP and we went towards one degree and had a little LOP there, okay, perpendicular. Okay, this is LOP2. I know there's one question that you all are kind of wondering, it comes up frequently. We took this site in the morning, we sailed all day, and then we took this site. What do we do about that? Um, obviously, by sailing all day, this LOP is not accurate anymore. Well, it's a simple process to advance your first LOP. It just takes a minute, less than a minute. You can take any point on this line, uh, any point on your LOP. doesn't matter, you can take this point if you want, but you can take any point on your LOP. Let's say we were sailing at a course not due west, but southwest. Um, let's say our, our true course was 260 degrees. So we just take a line at a direction of 260 degrees, just using the, um, use the compass rows as closest on the nautical chart. And draw your line at 260 degrees. That's 260. And let's say we're sailing at five knots for seven hours. So that would be 35 nautical miles. So we just go over to our latitude scale, same latitude that we're talking about. Latitude scale on the side, and that's a little more than half a degree, 35 nautical miles, 35 minutes of latitude. Take that distance with our dividers, mark off the distance on our direction, and then we advance our LOP just by drawing a parallel line through this, to our LOP, through this point here. And that's going to be here. So that's our LOP advanced to the new time, let's say it was 4 o'clock, 1600 afternoon, 1600 hours. Okay? And so our actual position is not where the first LOP1 from the morning crossed LOP2 from the evening. Our actual positions were the 
LOP advanced from the morning crosses the afternoon position, uh, afternoon LOP. And so our actual position is right there. Very easy to advance an LOP. Okay, um, so sun sites are the easiest. Um, it's fun to take stars and planets, it's fun to take the moon. Um, the advantage of stars and planets is you each one beyond two stars checks your position because you start having all these LOPs crossing each other. The other advantage is you probably, if you take your sights fairly quickly and you're not sailing too fast, you probably don't really have to advance your LOP, although technically you would advance it. Certainly on a ship traveling at 30 knots, you'd advance your, each of your LOPs to the position of the final LOP. Um, because at 30 knots, you're going to introduce a fair amount of error. But sailing at a small, at a slow speed, you can just take your star sights and your sun, your star sights and your planets and your moon, take them fairly quickly, and just use them without any advancing. So with multiple sights, you're going to get a bunch of LOPs crossing, and you might get one that's way over here someplace, and it's like, whoa, that one, I throw that one, I'm going to throw that one out because the other four cross in a really small area that define about a half mile area. Um, so this one obviously I messed up. The wave hit the boat just at the wrong moment and I, I didn't even feel very good about that reading. I, I thought that one might be off. But these other ones are all right in the same area crossing really close together and that defines my position really precisely. Defines my position and then the other lines check it. Okay, um, now let's take Let's get rid of some of this stuff. Let's get rid of the advanced LOP. Because I want to tell you one, give you a little foresight into what were some of the details here. Um, and if you have seen some of this stuff before, you might say, oh, why is he leaving that out? Or why isn't he talking about that? But I want to make sure you understand the basic principles first. Okay. Here. Now, the first thing that we're up against is you can't even conceive of a table that you can enter with four different variables. Uh, the AP, latitude and longitude, and the GP, latitude and longitude. So we're going to have to do something to combine these, because um, otherwise the table would be hundreds of volumes. Um, and we can't, we don't have room for that. If you're using a celestial calculator, you can just enter with four variables, but when you're using tables, and tables are totally reliable, you can get it, I mean, it can be wet, it can be, you know, it's, it, there's no way to really destroy these, uh, unless you drop it overboard. That's not good. Um, whereas a celestial calculator, again, we're back to electronics and batteries and on-off switches and all sorts of variables that you won't be able to repair on your own. Um, so, what, how are the tables going to work? Well, this problem, this problem cannot be moved way up the globe. If we move the problem way up the globe, the distances, the difference between the longitudes um, becomes minute. Uh, all of a sudden, all the numbers are different. If you move any problem up to where the longitude lines are converging, up at all or down at all, the problem changes. The distance would change. The HC would change. However, if we move the problem around the globe, keeping it at the same latitude, the problem stays the same. So here are the four things we have to go into the tables with. Basically, we have to tell the table, but we can combine two of them. So, AP longitude, AP latitude, uh, GP latitude, and GP longitude. Those are the four things that we want to tell the table. But two of them, two of these things we can combine. But we cannot move the problem up or down. We have to, we can move it around the globe. We can move the problem around the globe, but we have to keep the problem at the same latitude. So, 
we can't we can't combine latitude and latitude because that could if we don't tell it it's the, the actual latitudes we're it doesn't know where to put the problem on the globe. The tables don't know whether it's up at the North Pole or down at the equator. And it's a totally different problem. However, we can combine the longitudes, those two, and tell the table the difference in longitude. So, the difference in longitude longitude between these two longitudes and then we can tell it the assumed position latitude and the GP latitude, the latitude of the Sun. So now we've got it down to three things. The difference in longitude and our, la our assumed position latitude and the ground point latitude. And that now lets us get into the table. The um, table is going to call these things slightly different things, though. Um, and remember, this is just an advanced preview. This is starting to get... We don't want to get you too confused about this, but I just want to give you a preview, because we'll look at the table in depth in Part 2. The uh, GP latitude is actually going to be called the declination. Declination. And we'll abbreviate that as DEC. It's just the latitude. There's nothing different. It's just purely latitude of the sun or planet or star. GP longitude is going to be called GH Greenwich hour angle, GHA. And that in the western hemisphere is just the longitude. In the eastern hemisphere it's different. We have to do a simple calculation because longitude is measured 180 degrees east, 180 degrees west. Greenwich hour angle is measured all the way around to the west, from east to west starting at Greenwich. So in the western hemisphere, GHA, Greenwich hour angle is the same as longitude. In the eastern hemisphere we have to correct for the difference. Okay, when we combine the longitudes, we're going to come up with a difference in longitude, and that's just called local hour angle. Hour angle makes sense, Greenwich hour angle, because each hour the Earth spins 15 degrees. So longitude talked about as an hour angle from Greenwich makes sense. The local hour angle just means the difference between the longitude where we are, or our assumed position is, and the longitude where the Sun is, or the Greenwich hour angle of the Sun. So just the difference in longitude. Okay, so that's just a bit of a preview. Sounds a little bit complicated at this point. A little bit complicated, but once you grasp what the tables are doing, then it's really clear. It isn't complicated, and the math is simple. You're just, you're just using the tables to solve the distance between these two points and then the table for you turns the distance into a computed, uh, computed sextant reading that you would have gotten if you'd been at the AP. Okay, um, there's one more diagram that we can look at. Let's look at it quickly and then that'll be the end of part one. And that may be, you know, if you're actually heading out to sea and planning on crossing an ocean, um, you definitely want to stay tuned for part two. But if your interest in celestial navigation is just because you wanted to learn something new and it's an exciting, interesting subject, then you may not want all the details of uh, how to get into the table. Um, some of the stuff we were talking about just now, uh, entering the table with three, f three factors as opposed to four variables. Um, but part two will guide you all through the last of the details, um, starting with correcting your sextant site from HS, height sextant, to height observed, and then height adjusted. 
a uh, couple of corrections there um, based on how high you are above the water. If you're high up on a ship's bridge looking down on the horizon, you have to correct for that. If you're six feet off the water, you correct. It's a smaller correction, but you still correct for it. And then correcting for altitude distortion of the light depending on the angle that you're shooting at. If the sun is low, there's a higher altitude correction, a bigger altitude correction because the light is bent more. If the sun's straight up, the altitude correction is zero because the light coming straight through the atmosphere would be not bent at all. Um, although, of course, you never shoot straight up because you can't do that. It's too, too awkward to do that. Okay, um, so those corrections and then uh, there's some corrections in the Nautical Almanac uh, that you're going to use. Um, one correction is to get to the exact second that you took the sight. Because the Almanac won't tell you every second, it'll tell you um, the ti times, but then the, the position of the sun at a certain time, and then it'll jump to the next time. And you have to correct in between those two positions to find exactly where it was at the exact second that you took your sight. And again, the Nautical Almanac guides you through that. It's very simple and it's an easy correction, but you do have to know how to do it. So that's another detail. And then the last um, details are really how to get into the site reduction tables with the three variables. Um, the difference in longitude between the assumed position and the ground position and your latitude and the sun's latitude or declination. Um, so we'll go through that. And then there's one more detail about choosing your assumed position so it's easy to go into the table. Um, it's easier if you choose your assumed position so it's a whole degree of latitude and so the difference between your longitude of the longitude of your assumed position and the longitude of the sun or planet that you shot, so the difference is uh, a whole degree. Um, you cannot change the latitude of the sun though. You can't adjust that and say, well, let's just round it off because then your sight's off, your whole problem work is off. But the assumed position, we can move wherever we want to make it easier to get into the table. We'll go into that in detail. So there's some details to add to this, but we now have a framework that we can build on. And this framework of the three diagrams is you want to make sure that that framework, you don't want to start building on a framework that's shaky. You want to make sure that that framework with these three diagrams is really solid and secure before you start adding details. So make sure you understand all three of these diagrams, how we did it, especially that last one, the trick, where you just are choosing a random point. That's the part that bothers people. Why, why would I choose that point? Well, it doesn't matter what point you choose, except some points make it, by choosing a point a little more carefully, it makes it easier to get into the table, uh, to enter the table. So we'll go over that really carefully. Well, let's look at this last thing. This last thing is pretty neat. This is a very, very simple application of some of what we've just learned. This is taking a noon site. The noon site is neat because there's a special, it's a very special situation. It only gives you one piece of information. It gives you your latitude. But in five minutes, you can take a noon site and work it out and have your latitude. And that's pretty neat. That's pretty useful. Um, so, let's take our Earth. Let's, let's draw it first and then take a look at the globe. Here's our world here. North Pole and South Pole and the center of the Earth. We're slicing it now right through, so we have the both poles and the center of the earth. Okay, that's easy. Well, let's also slice it so we have our position. Let's put ourselves heading for Hawaii again. 
Here we are off the west coast of North America, heading for Hawaii, and we've sliced the Earth right through our position, through the North Pole, through our position, through the South Pole, and through the center of the Earth, and made it into a flat plate here on the board. Okay, now, is there any way we can also get the position of the Sun on this diagram? Or is the Sun going to be above the board or behind the board? We've just sliced the Earth straight through our position, North Pole, South Pole, center of the Earth. How can we get the Sun on this diagram? Well, what is the one time of day that the Sun will actually be on this flat plane, the same plane as we're on? One time of day, right at local noon, doesn't mean your clock says 12 o'clock necessarily. Local noon is defined as the moment when the sun is directly south of you, due south. And when the sun is due south of you, it lines up on this slice of the flat plane that we've drawn on the board, and we can put the sun's GP on this diagram. Here's the equator, we can put the equator in too. Here's the equator. And the sun is north of the equator. It's summertime. But um, the sun is north of the equator. And this is our position. This is us. Let's call that us. And here's the GP of the sun, ground point of the sun here, center of the earth. Now let's do that. Let's go back to that first diagram that we had on the board and draw a line out to the sun. Remember the line to the sun would go right through the GP. Joe is standing right here at the GP, looking straight up at the sun. It's right over his head. And then let's add our other lines in, a line that comes straight out through us. That's our vertical, straight down through our feet to the center of the earth. And then our horizon, perpendicular to the vertical, horizontal, perpendicular to vertical here. And that's 90 degrees there. And then all the lines of the sun coming in parallel to that. All the lines of the sun are parallel here. Parallel. Everything's parallel. Because the sun is far away. Far enough away to call it infinitely far away. Parallel line here coming into us. Like so. Now, when we take our sextant reading on the height of the sun... That's here, HS, height sextant. Okay, now what have we got? What are we trying to find? We're trying to find our latitude. We're trying to find this whole angle from where we are down to the equator. That defines our latitude. That is the latitude. That's what latitude means. So we want to find this angle here. Well, here's the GP here. We can look up in the table what the latitude of the GP is. And in fact, you're getting so advanced now, let's just call it the declination, abbreviated, dec. Declination, which is latitude, it's no difference. The lat declination of the sun here, let's say that looks like about 10 degrees. 10 degrees north. Declination of the sun, 10 degrees north. We just call it declination just so it's separate. We know when we say declination, it's not our latitude, it's the sun's latitude. That's the only reason we say declination instead of latitude. They're exactly the same. Okay, now what we're trying to figure out is our latitude. Well, let's look at this. This angle is HS, so this angle here has to be 90 minus HS. Let's switch to red here. So here we are. This is this angle here is 90, so this has to be 90 minus HS, same as on our first diagram, exactly the same. And this line here is parallel to this line, the sun's rays coming in. If you want me to extend that, I can, just so you can see it easier. And single line crossing those two lines, so this angle here is 90 minus HS. Okay? And now what have we got? This angle 
The sun's latitude is just this declination with 10 degrees. Let's give ourselves a section reading. What does it look like? It looks like about 50 degrees, doesn't it? 50 degrees. So 90 minus HS <clears throat> equals 40 degrees. So this angle here is 40 degrees. And the declination, the height of the sun above the equator is 10 degrees here. And what we're trying to find is the whole angle. Let's label this in here. This is the 10 degrees. The latitude of the sun, or the declination of the sun. What we're trying to find is this entire angle. So it would just be this inner angle, this, this angle, plus this angle. So that was 40, and that's 10. So our latitude has to be those two angles together, which would be 40 degrees plus 10 degrees. Our latitude is 50 degrees. And you can work this whole problem out in just a few minutes. Three or four minutes, five minutes at the most. So you've just solved with one sex in sight Right at local noon, you've just solved a problem and found your latitude. It's pretty helpful knowing your latitude, um, and being able to find it in five minutes is great. Okay, <clears throat> now, um, remember the table tells you the declination of the sun on that day. You don't even have to be very precise. The sun's declination doesn't change much throughout a day. So you don't have to do it hours, minutes, and seconds. You just do it that hour. The hour that you took the site, um, just pull the declination out. You'll find out next hour, it hasn't hardly changed. Declination doesn't change very fast. That's how the latitude of the sun doesn't change very fast. It changes day from one day to the next day, it will have changed enough that you need to allow for it. But during one day, it doesn't change much. Okay, so simple problem. There's your latitude. Any refinements on this, you still have to correct your sextant site. HS to H uh, observed to H um, adjusted. Um, still have to correct your sextant site, but that's like, you know, 30 seconds. Correcting your sextant site is really easy. And then you've got it. Now, just be a little bit careful because it's a different problem when the sun's in the northern hemisphere than when it's in the southern hemisphere. Um, let's just revise this and say the sun is south of the equator. It's winter in the northern hemisphere. Let's look at it there. Uh, in our first case, in this case we just got, we found that latitude equals um, 90 minus HS plus declination, right? 90 minus HS plus the declination, northern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere, the sun's in the northern hemisphere, that's your, that's your uh, equation. You don't have to memorize this because the diagram is so simple. Just do your diagram. Let's put the sun in the southern hemisphere and see what we get. So now the sun is down here, GP. Let's put it at 10 degrees again. Declin equals declination. That's uh, 10 degrees south uh, now. Remember, labeling is important. Uh, in celestial navigation, if you fail to label things, uh, you're going to make mistakes. So, 10 degrees south, let's get that clear. Um, 10 degrees south equals declination now. Okay, now the sun's light is coming in this way from outer space. A new angle. We'll get this all cleaned up. The sun's light is coming in from here, south of the equator, 10 degrees south of the equator, and that's the sun's light there, sunlight there, sunlight here, coming in parallel to this ray of sun, 
you can get these lines straight. Parallel lines, parallel lines, sexton side HS, 90 minus HS here. Now, par parallel lines, single line, be careful here, it's this whole distance here that's 90 minus HS here. Same as this angle up here, right? Two parallel lines crossed by a single line. Now our latitude is, and here's the declination here. Declination, because this is the equator right across here. So now our latitude is different. Now our latitude is this whole angle minus the declination. So we have a southern hemisphere Hemisphere, our latitude is equal to 90 minus HS minus declination for the noon site. You guys see the difference? Minus declination versus plus declination. So rather than memorize these, just learn the diagram because the diagram makes sense. You can always, you can sketch out the diagram in 30 seconds on a piece of paper. And on a voyage, you only have to do it every six months. Do your new diagram every six months. Because the sun only crosses the horizon, crosses the equator every six months. Okay, so that's the noon site. Super simple, easy, easy to do, fast and easy. Um, oh, one refinement, or last note on the noon site is how do you know when it's local noon? Uh, if you don't know where your position is, how do you figure out when the sun's going to be due south of you at its highest point? Well, that's a good question. Um, you can figure out, based on your dead reckoning position, about when you think the sun will be due south of you. And this is actually why we don't do noon sites as often as we might, because it's kind of a nuisance to figure out exactly when it's going to be the right time to do your noon site. However, when it's getting close, you start watching the sun. And it's moving fast. You, you're cranking away on the vernier knob pretty quickly. It's going up, 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 up. Well, right at local noon, the sun seems to level off. And for a few seconds, even, it just seems to be staying level. And then all of a sudden it starts down again. And so your highest reading is your local noon. When it's gone, and all that time too, you're arcing, you're swinging your sextant in an arc, making sure you're getting to the horizon. And you keep following the sun up, and then you don't follow it down at all. You check your sextant at the highest reading, and that's your local noon. Okay? So you don't have to compute the time accurately. In fact, because of the fact that the so the sun levels off for a few seconds, it's not an accurate way to get your longitude. You could say, well, if I, what if I record the exact second that the sun is at its highest point? That'll tell me my, long, my longitude too. Well, technically, mathematically, yes, that would be true, but it's really hard to record to know exactly when the sun by a watch is at its highest point just by looking at it with the sextant. So um, realistically, as far as any accurate um, measurement, getting your latitude, the noon site's really only good for your latitude. And it's for the latitude though, it's totally accurate. Within the accuracy of your sextant, maybe half a mile is a good sextant. Okay, so that's the noon site. So we've covered a lot. The first three diagrams explain how celestial navigation is done. And then this last diagram is just sort of an offshoot of the first diagram, a specific situation, a specific um, situation where the sun is directly south of us so we can put the sun on the same plane as our position in the North Pole and South Pole. So a specific application of the first concept. Okay, um, part two, we'll go into the details Make sure this part, though, 
all these diagrams are really, really clear. Explain them to somebody else. Take somebody aside and say, hey, let me show you this. It just takes half an hour and you can do all three diagrams in about 20 minutes, half an hour if you know them well. Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome to the world of celestial navigation. Bye now.